Hi, everyone. Uh, it's 2.15, so let's get started. I'm Ships. And um, for those of you who know me really well, know that I'm such a big fangirl of deployment patterns. Oh, really, Ships? If you're such a big fan of deployment patterns, name the top three. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do, Alex. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Alex <laughs> Klingenberg. I'm a lead engineer at Octopus Deploy. And I'm Ships. I am a principal product manager also at Octopus Deploy. And if you hadn't guessed already, we are from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kia ora. So, kia ora. Um, all right, so we're here from Octopus Deploy. For those of you who don't know, Octopus helps teams automate their soft software deployments. It helps make complex deployments simple. Now, although we're here from Octopus, this is not a sales pitch. We're not going to talk about the actual product. But the context is important because as being part of Octopus, we've had the privilege to work with over 3,000 customers. Um, and we've developed a deep understanding of their deployment scenarios, what works and what doesn't work. And that's what we're hoping to share with you today. But you might be wondering, why is that even important? Well, imagine this. Failed upgrades, service outage incidents, half-done database migrations, and that dreaded 1 a.m. call on a Sunday morning. So when deployments fail, there are fires everywhere. And so getting your deployment strategy right um, is actually a key ingredient for a peaceful life as a software developer. All right, we've got 20 minutes, so we're going to run through this really quickly. But if you don't remember anything, these are some three key takeaways that I want you to walk out this room with. First, your deployment strategy is deeply contextual to your business's goals, products and services, and the industry and environment that you're operating in. Second, your deployment strategy should solve your problems for today and not really worry about what might come tomorrow. And last, your deployment strategy needs to be repeatable, reliable, and maintainable. You need to be able to run through that process multiple times and iterate on it, because that's how you will uncover the next layer of problems. It's kind of like a riverbed, right, where you take off the big pieces, the big rocks, and then the river's water level goes down, and then you start to uncover the smaller pebbles and rocks underneath the next layer of problems. All right, now that I've given the secret sauce away, uh, let's get into it. Okay, I wanted to start by setting some context. Now, to us, for the context of this talk, a deployment strategy enables you to push your changes out to customers, so get that value in the hands of your customers, while minimizing risks and, business, and meeting business goals. And your company might have different types of risk tolerance. For example, healthcare is way more risk averse than, say, gaming. Uh, your company may have different goals, like enforcing zero downtime or accounting for 10x peak usage and then scaling back down, things like that. And you'll see these goals and constraints sort of play out through the examples we're going to walk through today. Now, a deployment pattern, again, for the context of this talk, for me, uh, we've defined it as a combination of steps, activities, and um, decisions that enable your deployment strategy, so that enable you to push out your changes. So to me, a pattern is simply the implementation of your overall deployment strategy. Now, I know when people think of deployment patterns, we commonly think of rollout, canary, blue-green, all that kind of stuff. For me, uh, for this uh, talk, sorry, we've sort of classed that as rollout patterns, and those rollout patterns are pretty much the last step of deploying your changes. All right, so we've got some context and definition out of the way. Um, now, uh, we're going to talk through three deployment strategies today and in the context of three different industries. So three examples there. First, consumer SaaS, retail, and then finance. And for each of those examples, we're going to talk through their goals and constraints, how they might have structured their CI/CD pipelines, and then the last bit, how they actually roll out their changes, their rollout pattern. Now remember, all of the examples that we present today, although they're generic, they're actually based off of real customer scenarios and um, based off customers that we actually work with day to day. All right. Now, without a further ado, uh, let's move on to our first example with Alex. All right. I'm going to walk you through a B2C software as a service product 
uh, you can imagine, a language learning app. And not an actual customer, but I think it's a, an example we're all pretty familiar with. So there are three things that are incredibly important in a SaaS business. Number one is your speed. You need to be able to innovate quickly, deliver new features to keep ahead of that well-funded competitor who's coming up behind you. The second most important one is availability. Your customers are paying you good money for the service that you're providing them. You need to make sure you have decent uptime to match. And finally, uh, they care about scale, right? Again, the customer is paying for it. You need to be able to meet their demands. So with this context in mind, let's take a little look at the SaaS example. Your users aren't necessarily just your customers. Uh, you may have uh, your actual customers, your paying customers, interacting with your application through, say, um, a web page, browser, might also have a mobile app. Uh, you probably also have some internal users, right? So internal users might be the people who are creating the language learning modules and maintaining that sort of content that you serve to your customers. Everywhere I've ever worked, uh, they get a truly horrible server-side rendered forms-based app. Maybe you guys are a bit fancier, hopefully. What's important here is that all of those use cases, they connect up into this extremely generic uh, <laughs> cloud uh, microservices architecture. And we're going to take this example of an identity service through our deployment pipeline. So what I want you to note about the microservices in this example is that they are independently deployable and independently scalable units, and they are tied to the domain of the business, right? We're thinking domain-driven design here, uh, and that is going to become important as we talk about how uh, we roll things out. All right, let's take a little look at what our CICD pipeline might look like. You're going to have the typical spread of environments, uh, some of them uh, more strict than others. What's important with these environments is you're likely to need to repeat a series of your deployment steps uh, for each of them, but some of them may not need all of them. So for example, if you're spinning up like an ephemeral environment for development, for testing, you're not going to need the same set of steps, but you want to have reusable and composable steps in order to service those environments. Uh, coming down to what the pipeline's going to look like, probably based on push from your uh, code repository. And so if you look at our identity service across the top, you can see that it has the opportunity to share reusable components through the CI and CD phases, but it is an independently deployable unit. Let's talk about why this matters. So uh, let's have a look at uh, bringing this all together. All right. When you come to do rollout, I'm not going to dive into the details of what a blue-green deployment uh, or a rolling deployment uh, strategy looks like. Let's talk instead about the constraints that you need, because these two things have one thing in common. In order to get the most benefit out of them, you need to be able to run multiple versions of the same service in production at the same time. And there are some pretty typical developer constraints that you need to meet in order to be able to do that. So this is going to hit your developer team. For example, uh, you need incremental database migrations. There is no point having a deployment strategy that enables you to roll back a version if your database uh, is going to blow up as soon as you take it back. So you need to be able to run versions of the same server, uh, uh, sorry, different versions of the same service in parallel. This means controlling functionality with something else like a feature flag, maybe. And finally, inter-service communication has to be carefully versioned, right? So these are, these are constraints on your development team. But what this is going to give you if we look at the benefits, it gives you something close to zero downtime. I'm never going to promise anyone zero downtime, but it gives you something close enough because you can run these versions in parallel. And remember what we said about uh, the importance in SaaS first of being uh, your ability to iterate quickly, to push out changes, um, and for your customers to have really high availability. That's going to give you that. Again, these strategies will allow you to roll back early uh, based on like early, early signal uh, and that, again, services the customer's need for availability. Uh, and it also gives your dev teams confidence that they can deploy their changes knowing that there is a safety net there to catch them if they do go a bit wonky. And finally, these decoupled services, they can be updated and deployed independently, scaling out your dev teams and also just adding to that uh, awesome speed of innovation. All right, that was a fairly generic high-level SaaS example. Let's look at something a tiny bit more complex, like a retail example. All right. Our example here is a DIY chain store. We're talking brick and mortar store. Yep, they probably have some sort of online uh, sales capacity. That's 
basically our SAS example. Let's talk about what the in-store thing is gonna look like. You're still gonna be talking to the same cloud environment, but you likely have a lot of physical devices. Examples might be a point of sale system, uh, often handheld tablets or something that they use for stock taking, things like that. And the retail store is going to have opening hours that we are going to take advantage of when we talk about the constraints of this model. All right, so when we model this, we're not looking at a microservices architecture here. We're gonna look at a uh, tenanted architecture. Ships, move me over. All right, looking at this example, like we're from New Zealand, it's not very big. I hear you guys in the States, you have uh, like 50 different regions or something. Your scale can be absolutely massive. So we are breaking down our regions um, because generally they're in the same time zone, arguable sometimes, uh, looking at Australia. Uh, and then you can have hundreds of stores uh, just even within that region. And if some of those stores are out in the wop wops, your network con uh, connectivity can be pretty crap. So this is an important constraint because even within a store, you can have a lot of devices. And so the constraint here starts to become time and availability. Because when we are thinking in a retail context, it's not so much that speed of innovation that's important, it is enabling your floor staff to do their job, to sell, right? So you really need to make sure that you are not interrupting that and that you are uh, consistently updating these devices so they're not gonna have any problems during the day when they need to actually be focusing on their customers. So, what I want you to note here, you might have multiple applications, but you're still gonna want to deploy them in a related group together. So let's take a look at that CI CD pipeline for this one. All right, so we had a pipeline per service in our SaaS example. Now we have a pipeline per product. And so we want to deploy the different applications uh, that may have shared functionality. Uh, we wanna update all of them in a single store in a single go within that closing window. So our environment lifecycle, that's probably gonna be roughly similar to our SAS example here. Again, some of that reusability stuff that we talked about before. Um, but what's really important is to note that when you group these uh, items together, we're looking at maybe a 10 minute deployment time overall, allowing for some pretty crap network connectivity. So what does this end up with? How do we think about our deployments in this scenario? Let's take a look at our rollout strategy. So with the time and bandwidth constraints, what we start to see our customers doing is very strict scheduling of deployments. So they're going to be rolling through based on time zone, as many stores within a time zone as they can. Uh, Ships has done some great maths for us here, looking at approximately how many stores we might be able to roll out to. And so the constraints here are that your development team needs to be ready to deploy their changes. They need to have a clear set of changes ideally, and they need to make sure that that deployment process is really reliable and really repeatable because we don't want to have it failing and causing drama uh, when we only have a four, window, four hour window to get it all done. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Ships for our third and final most complex example. Thanks, Alex. So for our final example, we'll be looking at finance, specifically a bank. Uh, a bank is really the most complex example because of a few different reasons, and I'll walk you through them. First, they have many customers um, that they have to cater for. Think of us as the consumers at the top using their mobile banking app, share trading, ADMs, right? Then there's their internal staff, which is using apps as well. So think of the teller at the branch using an app, uh, using you know, home loan offices, using loan calculators, AML checks, all of that. And then on the back end, there is probably a bunch of third party and back end systems that the banks have to integrate with. Um, think of open banking APIs, fraud detection uh, solutions, and compliance center type stuff. Um, but the core of banking is actually transaction processing. And to do that, you know, we, we expect a bank to move money from A to B. That's you know, the, the, one of the basic things we expect it to do. And so um, a bank should be able to uh, process high volumes of transactions at very high accuracy levels as well. Now, all of these apps together, catering for different customers within the bank, uh, different users, um, Lee may have been homegrown, may be acquired, may have legacy behind them, could be cloud native. It's a mix of architectures, right? It's a Frankenstein architecture there. 
So there's really no point sort of mapping that. Um, but what that also leads to is there's different availability needs. So going back to the core, like the transaction processing and banking stuff, that's got very high availability needs. Um, you're looking somewhere around five nines usually for that. And um, I think I read somewhere in US, if a bank goes down for just one hour, it costs them about $9.3 million. So, you know, money serious business. So, but you can imagine, for example, some of the other systems like a home loan calculator doesn't need that kind of availability at all, right? Um, so we walked through some of those constraints there. The last one I wanted to highlight is banks are highly regulated. They're regulated both by local government and, you know, um, country government, um, but also by international bodies. So what that means is security and compliance is at the top of their minds always. They need a very highly traceable, shareable, visible audit log um, for throughout their systems. So we've walked through their software systems and the constraints there. Let's look at what their CI CD pipelines might look like. Again, uh, various different architectures means that they probably all need their own version of a CI CD pipeline. So in a bank, we think about pipelines as pipelines per component. Um, so each component within the whole system requires a different kind of pipeline. Here are just two examples. Uh, first one is your generic cloud native pipeline, but with banks, usually they're using multiple uh, cloud, cloud providers, um, also a mix of private and public cloud. Um, and the second one is possibly a legacy pipeline where you have no automated progression at all and you're pretty much moving scripts from one environment manually to another until it makes it to some hardware. The thing that's common across all the pipelines at a bank is that past a dev test environment, every other uh, step needs some kind of approval and check in place. And that's to enforce that compliance and security constraint. All right. Um, when it comes to rollout, banks want very controlled and, you know, a manual uh, rollout. There are specialized operations teams that are, their um, job is to move stuff from, uh, you know, move, move changes into production. That's what they specialize in. And they're, um, you know, taking all of those different systems into account and their availability needs and managing it across some sort of schedule, weekly, monthly, whatever, and, um, you know, deploying those changes. The other capabilities that a team like that might have is capabilities around draining transactions in progress. So if there are any financial transactions that are in progress, you need to stop them. So then you can push out your changes and then you can start a new batch to maintain the atomicity of those transactions. Um, and they also use something called a chain set that, you know, different banks have different terminology, terminology around this, but a chain set basically encapsulates the state of the state of the bank across all of their systems as a list of change requests. And that's really important because they need a way to roll back to a known state um, where the new things were working, right? So um, there's then the new chain set, which then has all of your new changes going out, and that provides that controlled rollback capability as well as that traceability. And then last thing, they probably have some sort of manual acceptance testing at the end of all of their deployments uh, with a go, no go decision whether to keep the new one or roll back to the current. And that's generally how they meet with all of their business um, constraints and risks. And that was our final example. And I'll hand back to Alex to wrap this up for us. All right. I hope you're still with us. This has been a lightning fast sprint. Uh, this talk was originally 40 minutes. So thank you for bearing with our, our speed run. Coming back to those key takeaways, the context of your business is really what is going to drive this. So we've talked about the constraints, like uh, really strict constraints on your development team in a SaaS example, uh, perhaps constraints on when you can deploy in retail, um, and a lot of the manual overhead for banks. It is a lot easier to get buy-in across your organization and to get people pointed in the right direction if you can take these constraints that come from the benefits of these deployment patterns and you can actually tie them to the business goals, right? I'm sorry, not everyone needs zero downtime deployment. Uh, does that really matter? Not to everyone. 
But for some people, maybe that is the most important thing, right? You need to be able to justify it, I guess. So, solving the problems that you have today. It's a similar thing, right? Uh, there is no point trying to design for the system you have in the future. If you're solving the problems in front of you and moving towards those goals that you know are gonna deliver so much value, uh, it is a lot easier to kind of iterate on those and get closer if you are focusing on what's in front of you. And finally, in order to enable you to do this kind of iteration, this moving towards things, your pipeline needs to be repeatable, it needs to be reliable, and it needs to be maintainable. Uh, it doesn't have to be fully automated. Not everyone is there. But these, these qualities are things that you can build in without needing the fancy tooling, without necessarily needing to have it all written down. So, that is it from us today. Um, I don't think we have time for questions, but we would love to chat to you in the hallway. Oh, we have stickers. Uh, we also maybe have some t-shirt vouchers if you would like. Um, and thank you all so much for your time. <laughs>